come once again to discuss things. It is I, the one, the only. Welcome to another episode of Geeky Gentlemen. I'm Sid Partu. Joining me today is... A geek for fun. Indeed. And today we're doing a review of the of season one of the Sci-Fi Channel series, Krypton. Um, so, Alfie, you're the, the resident Superman fan here. You're, you're more into Superman than I am. Um... Did you did you ever hear my joke about Krypton that I'm sure was totally original and no one else ever thought of? Um, no, but I can guess what lines it's going along because it's going to be the joke everyone makes when they thought about it, but go ahead. All right, so we had Smallville for 10 years, and now we'll have Krypton, and, you know, I figure the next logical place to go after that is is a show called Pod, where it'll just be the adventures of, of baby <laughs> Superman's pod through space, because God forbid we ever get a show about Superman. Um, everything around him is fair game, but the second he puts on the cape and stuff, it's just so uninteresting. <laughs> you know what the funniest thing about that was? Is like, even they, when they announced it, they were also like, oh, by the way, we're also going to do a Lois Lane Lex Luthor show about Metropolis before Superman came in. And I'm like, you're literally stretching so hard for time frames where Superman's not doing shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the idea of a Krypton show, I mean, it's just, it's really easy to make fun of because of DC's attitude towards Superman. And, and so that was the thing that, like, really turned me off and and made me have basically no interest in it whatsoever but i don't know it was it was kind of a weird confluence of events that made me want to watch this i've got the dc universe app and they've got a number of things on there um the the show i was watching through previously was legion of superheroes and my plan had been legion of superheroes and then i'll finally go ahead and watch titans and i finished legion of superheroes and i mean it's just it's got Brainiac 5, and and I really like Brainiac 5 as a character, and Brainiac himself is just an interesting villain, so I was like, you know, I, the, the last few episodes of that series, it's, it's all about Brainiac, so I just, I was like, Krypton's there, I remember seeing Brainiac was in, like, the tra trailers and stuff, it's only one season, let's give it a go, and I gotta say... For a premise that I am strongly against, just on, you know, the, the principle of not giving Superman a goddamn show about Superman, I think it's a fairly well-executed series. Right. I think I'm, I'm lining up with you there as well, because, like I when it was first announced, I was also like, really? Who the fuck? It's not even about jor -El. Like, that I could buy. It's about jor like, <laughs> father. Like, this is even more disdain from the, literally the person no one gives a shit about. Uh, and, like, that, they could have really... If this had committed to being just that, the drama, that, the soap opera, is just this guy going around doing things and then the odd note of, oh, this is where he gets the name for this Superman family member or something, and just did that, it would have been exactly what the jokes met up to and just been nothing. The fact that they seemingly realized that they need to make a hook and that it still is directly about Superman as the central plot point, like Superman is still the most important thing to come out of Krypton. He's the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they highlight that up front almost immediately mm -hmm. and they're completely honest about it and the major callbacks later on in the season are all about Superman callbacks and Superman, like, his threats and what they relate to him. I thought that was a very smart move that immediately made me gravitate more. So, okay, let's see what you do with this. Let's see what you have to say about this in relation to Superman, rather than what it first came across as, as, oh, we're avoiding Superman as much as we can. Yeah, while still retaining all the rights to him, you know. 
Um, yeah, that's that's kind of where I came down on it. Is it does very much feel like it's it's still actually about Superman as opposed to um, something that's that's just trying to do Superman without doing Superman. Um, so that's the thing that that made it really fresh to me, and the fact that Brainiac's the main villain really does help it. Um, the the fact that we're giving an origin for Candor and everything does help because. Uh, there, there are people, and, and I, at times I agree with them, I'm, I'm kind of more in the middle ground for it, but I think there are people in the Superman fan community that want to know every single little detail about what Krypton was like, and then there are other people who literally want the anything to do with Krypton to end with, and his father Jor-El sent him away to Earth. And that's the, the, there are people who want that to be the last thing we ever know about Krypton. Um, and, yeah. and, and so I'm somewhere in the middle. I like the ideas of, of getting into, you know, Kryptonian society and, and having like the, the uh, evils of, of his people's past kind of come back to haunt Superman. I think that can be kind of interesting. And I even like, you know, I, I like my Superman like I like my Jesus. I like my savior metaphors. I even like that Jor-El could have picked any planet, but he chose Earth for a reason. Um, I, you know, to he saw something in in Earth and and something about them that like made him decide to send Superman, send Clark there, as opposed to just any other planet with a yellow sun. Um, well, I'm not with you there, but I can like with I, I get what you mean. We're like, there's so many different aspects with Krypton. It isn't worth outright ignoring. There was doing this does have merit, and I think it does justify that. Yeah, I don't know. I like I like playing around with that idea. It depends on to what extent. Because um, I mean, I just like Donner Superman so much uh, that I, <laughs> yeah. I can't help but kind of like they can be a great people if they wish to be, uh, like that that kind of thing uh, that gets me in a place. Um, so I don't know. This was this was just an interesting kind of unexpected ride, and then they, you know, it really helps that it's again, it's not just oh, this week the Kryptonian Society did this, this, and this. It helps that it's a timey wimey show. I feel um, I, I really do think that aspect of it helped it out a little bit. That you got you know Adam Strange, and it's all about time travel, trying to you know save Superman in a way that Superman can't necessarily save him, himself. I thought that was kind of a cool idea. Yeah, definitely as well, because immediately the biggest problem, just drama-wise and getting people to care, is everyone, literally everyone on the planet, knows how this has to end, is mm -hmm. Krypton blows up. So how do you care about these characters who you know are going to die and be insignificant for the rest of the things you actually do care about and the media you have consumed? You know for all that to exist, none of this has to matter. The key to doing that is, okay, you do the timey-wimey shit, and you say, oh no, if we don't do these certain things, the actual things you've cared about will change for the worse. And that immediately gives you tangible stakes in a series that shouldn't have them. And that's really impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the thing I think I was most impressed by. Um, the other thing that, you know, Goyer is obviously involved in this in some way, shape, or form. And I don't think he's really all that involved from a plotting aspect or anything like that, because this really doesn't feel like a Goyer story. But what I think it might be is just the society that we see of Krypton here is so goddamn similar to the way it was presented in Man of Steel. You know, yeah, the, the, it... it's, it's very brief in Man of Steel, but it's, it's pretty damn right off the, the same book, literally. It, it's literally Plato's Republic all over again. Right up to, like, just the, the genetic bullet births, picking things from different class cultures. Even the look of it, compared to every version of Krypton, this feels a lot more like how Snyder and Goya handled it, where it's, it's a lot more dingy than you'd expect Krypton to be. But it's nevertheless very. It, it feels more organic in a when saying that. Like it feels like a, a planet that has been so drained of resources and everything that they kind of have to be just dingy. But everything therefore has got this aged feel. I like the look. It's not what I would go with, but for this kind of budget and what you can do, I think it's impressive that they pulled it off. Yeah, yeah. I wish that we maybe saw a little bit more crystal technology kind of thing, because just you know, the the Fortress of Solitude's been pretty. 
I guess the, I don't know. Has Fortress of Solitude kind of always looked like a bit of an ice castle kind of thing, or is um, that just post Superman that's... 1978? Since the Donner, yes. Okay. Before that, not so much. Okay, well, um, that's interesting then. Yeah. It was always snowy, um, but mm-hmm. never never ice castle like pillars and like ice technology until Donna, and then that just stuck until Bendis came. Okay, no, that's understandable. I was just it, it just seems like one of those things that's kind of always been around. So I would have maybe liked a little bit more of that, but if they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. Um, so yeah, like the and honestly the the whole basing Kryptonian society off of Plato's Republic uh, with the, the class systems, you know, the warrior class and everything. Um, I thought that was that was one of the things I really, really enjoyed about Man of Steel. Um, that movie has kind of gone down a couple rungs for me in recent years since BVS, but there was one of the things I absolutely adore about that movie still to this day is the characterization of Zod, particularly that moment where he's like, everything I do, I do for the protection of krypton and you've just destroyed that like that's that's a really great moment to me and this kind of again this this sets zod up in very much the same way and and it's in fact interesting to see an entire society that's born to do a task and that that just becomes really really interesting so you know you got you got um darren vex who is born to survive and gain political power. That's what his entire life has been about uh, since birth. And that's that's all he knows how to do, even when it's it's very not beneficial for him. If he just, you know, could stop for 10 seconds, he'd probably be a little bit better off. And it's ultimately what gets him killed. So I thought that kind of stuff was, was really cool to see in here too. Definitely. And I think it works well when you pair that with the main threat being Brainiac, which is kind of like, Yes, Krypton is extreme, but like he's the ultimate extreme of that, where everything is just knowledge and it's meant to be stasis and forever and changing. Whereas here, although there is significantly less possibility for choice, like there is in like how in human society, there is still that tiny bit of hope, which like the the House of Al starts to represent once they start um, bringing in more kind of resistance against the the upper class and everything which i think that works well um the society stuff here is interesting i always do like the idea of brow as like this being that they're a krypton which is such a technologically focused society and such intellectual still has a god they believe in and a faith i don't know if i like it being so faith focused but I also understand that's mainly revealed later on is Brainiacs forcing that on a little bit more um, than might have otherwise. But I, I do like that aspect. I think it gives it layers that makes Krypton feel more lived in as like a, this place that isn't just backdrop for Superman. It feels like, yeah, there was other shit going on here that you can get invested into some of the world building. But I'm also at the same time, I'm, I'm glad that we don't get too much into the minutia. Shit just happens. Like, it's, oh, this is just something that's part of Krypton. They don't spend detail explaining everything, which I feel is a trap they could have fallen into. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Um, the the religious thing was, was kind of interesting because maybe we just interpreted it differently. Because um, obviously Brainiac doesn't take over the voice of Rao until, like, midway through the season, give or take. Um, I was kind of under the impression that that the the, Ra- the voice of Rao and all that stuff was just, like, it was was only in um, Kandor. Like, the you know, we, we talk about Kryptonopolis, which is just a terrible <laughs> name for a city. Anytime they, they try to throw Krypton into a thing and make it a word, it just kind of pisses me off. Because Supergirl did the same thing. They called it Kryptonese, and it just, as the language, and it just pissed me off immediately. Um, it sounds dumb. I don't know what else to say. It just sounds really dumb. Um, but, like, the, the impression I got was that the voice of Rao couldn't like like Krypton was operating again. I, it, it's hard not to pull from Greek stuff when when Plato is so much at play here. Um, I kind of got the the impression that like Kandor is one city state and Kryptopolis is another city state. Uh, and what would it be? Uh, oh, what's the name of the other one? The one that's floating around in space? 
uh, Argus or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, like that would be another city-state where they're effectively like completely different countries, but it's all just one big city. Um, and so I, the, the impression I got was that the voice of Rao is just the, the monarch, the, the, tech, uh, the theocrat in charge of Candor. Right, and then that definitely is, um, again, for anyone listening to this, I haven't watched the series in as long as, it's not as fresh in my mind, so I may be fuzzy on some details, but I do know that's mainly just my general knowledge of Superman coming is where it is just a global religion, and I do like, even though it is certainly implied to be more focused in Candor, it's still a thing that most Kryptonians have, and I, I do appreciate exploring that, because the idea of Krypton having a solar deity fits so well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, it's one of those things where I really do like details like that, uh, working in that, that Rao is not just, you know, because... I know, for some reason, has Rao always been associated with the sun, or is that just kind of them going a little more in-depth with it here? I think so. I think because it's such an obvious thing. It's definitely, definitely since Silver Age it's been that way. Okay. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. And then the idea that there are multiple gods on Krypton and there's like an ice goddess, I thought was a really cool idea um, because there are people of the ice... And, and I, I'll have a question here in a second. Let, don't let me forget that I have a question about the ice gods, uh, or the, the ice thing in particular. But, um, like, so you've got a god of the ice and a god of the sun, and, like, of course that would be what that society develops, living on a planet that's, like, such a, a tundra-based planet, and then just has, obviously, a, a very close sun by the, the little glimpses we see of it from time to time. I thought that was a really, really cool idea. Yeah, um, that's also a question I guess I'll ask you before we get into maybe your one is, how do you feel about like, because obviously constraints, we're only limited to so much of Krypton, but just just in general, like, how do you like this geography of Krypton we're given here where you do get to see certain places and like a proto-fortress of solitude and the, the underground and the upper town and the, the bars and stuff, like do you, how do you compare it to the other live action versions of Krypton we've seen? You know, it's really interesting. Um, the the set design is pretty cool. I do like the idea of kind of a proto fortress of solitude, but it it has the prequel problem. Um, like the the only thing I guess I can think to compare it to is um, the Darth Plagueis novel, uh, which is is about Darth Sidious's master, that he learned everything from, and like in that book. Plagueis does, like, all this work and and stuff to set up um, Sidious to become the, the leader of the, uh, the Republic. And I remember reading that. It just felt so anticlimactic because it, like, by, by creating a cool character in a prequel and having them do the things before the characters we know of are doing the things... It, it tends to kind of undercut the character. It, it tends to undercut the characters we already know about as in order to, you know, rise up these characters that we would otherwise have no reason to care about. So, like, I don't mind kind of a proto-Fortress of Solitude. Where it got a little iffy for me was that uh, Val L discovered the Phantom Zone. And so it just leaves me in a place where I'm like, well, what the fuck did Jor-El do? <laughs> like literally that if, if he doesn't dis- if he's not the one that discovers the phantom zone then what is he even there for it's like it, it just leaves you in a, a weird place so i thought that part of it was a bit odd i mean it definitely i don't know how you rewrite the show without the phantom zone i mean you need zod you need the the season finale um where they throw brainiac in the phantom zone i don't know how you do the show without the phantom zone but it just felt kind of odd to me to have Val L be, you know, Superman's great grandfather discovered the Phantom Zone. Well, then it's not making much sense why Zod particularly cares about Jor El because he wasn't a leader of the councils, right? Question mark. I don't know. No, he was just uh, on the council as like a scientist. Yeah. So it's, it's like, what what good does he do? Um, it just it just becomes a little weird, you know. Uh, so like stuff like that here and there was was kind of interesting. Um. 
I was really surprised at just how damn dingy parts of the city were. And I thought that, again, tying it to the, um, to the, the Plato's Republic, I think that does create probably the only good argument I could accept for the truth, justice, and the American way being Superman's catchphrase. Um, because the idea that you are born with a rank and that determines whether or not you get to live in a skyscraper or in, you know, a seedy alley where, like, the roof leaks every time it rains, um, I, it, you know, to contrast that with the idea of American liberty where you might be born in poor circumstances, but even, you know, and this is being far too generous, but even in the, the worst set of circumstances that you're born into, there's always a chance for you to get out and have unparalleled success, you know? And so that, that creates kind of an interesting uh, justification for that, that catchphrase in a number of ways. Right, and I get, again, I guess your mileage varies on like how much you want to keep that catchphrase around because I'm 100% in the count of ditch it. And it's Same, quite funny, I don't actually. Think we, I don't think that's a, a thing you can just pick to do. You know, I know, but I do, I'm gonna pick to do it anyway. Because <laughs> <laughs> I feel like what would be even more interesting, and maybe depending on how long this goes on for, I'm dealing with time travel stuff already. Maybe we could even get into this, but that's exactly Lex Luthor's argument. Hmm. And I feel like this, if we ever got a situation where Lex Luthor saw this Krypton. I feel like he may, like he, he could get something where he'd just be like, no, look, this is your people. This is wrong. You shouldn't be allowed here. Let me show you my way, like capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that kind of, you know, that, that stuff does kind of work for me. And, and again, I was like, you can't help but nerd out a little bit on the the intricacies of of the world building kind of stuff you know that that can get kind of fun to just nerd out on even if the the concept is weak um and it seems like dc has been doing a fair amount of that lately where it's like iffy concept but really well executed you know yeah they seem to be nailing in on the weirder concepts where it's like the more simple concepts they're fucking up on. Yeah, yeah. It's like, like Justice League, the movie, can't do that. Show about Superman's ancient past no one cares about. Yeah, that was all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Um, yeah, because I, I had the same reaction. It's like the, the concept does not appeal to me at all, but the execution, I have to admit, was really well done. I had the same reaction to, like, Injustice, the comic, you know? Um, so it's, it's just interesting that, that DC seems to be able to, to pull that one off. Um, all right, so let's, let's get into some of the other stuff here. Um, did you have a favorite character in the series? Yes, but I, I guess the series is already on season two at this point, so I don't really... Spoilers aren't going to be that much of an issue, right? Nah. I'm, I, I've already um, revealed how the whole series ends. I mean, all right. <laughs> then I, I got to be for that. My, I really, really like Zod in this. Yeah. Yeah. He's so good. Yeah. I I completely agree. Um, To, to throw him in and then like, just to see the, the family history of Zod was a really cool idea. But let me ask you this. Does making Zod and uh, Superman cousins, that's, that's what it would be, right? Cousins? Um, I guess jor no, I guess it'd be his yeah. uncle, wouldn't it? Yeah, because him and jor would be cousins. Yeah. So does making... No, him and jor would be brothers, half-brothers. Um, yeah, does, uncle, uncle, uncle. Yeah, yeah. Does, does making Zod, Superman's uncle, feel a little too fan y no, because like that whole thing, this is because this has been the problem with Zod like always and like every adaption is we always his problem is we imply he used to be an interesting character because he used to be friends with Jor-El and that has so much like, oh my God, 
Jor-El was this great person. He was friends with Zod, and now he's come back, and like it's going to be this big pathos between this is the son of my child, of my best friend, who's defying me, and like what could go into that? But they never go into that. They just immediately make him general dictator, and he just never. There's never a well enough done execution of those ideas. So I feel like making him even closer related only leads to okay, that should be even stronger. That that core idea of here is someone from Krypton who is an enemy, but at the same time is family in the sense of friendship with like a, your father, but now is literal family, but he's not like Kara, but he's like an actual threat. I think has always been strong. It just needs a better execution. But Zod in this is exactly how I like him, is where you have that, he's not one note. He's not a kneel before me at all times level like Terrence Stamp kind of figure. He's all he's got that pathos. He's got that belief in what he's doing like at all costs. Mm-hmm. But he's so he's like very much like a Batman character. Is where he's so driven. Anything that stands in his way to that is like we'll get trodden on. But then at the same time, I forget the name of the actor, but he delivers it so charismatically. You're kinda of like, yeah, I'll follow you. He's like, that's so well done. hmm Yeah, I tend to agree. I, I thought the the push to making him, um, you know, Superman's uncle was a maybe a little much, but you can't deny that the moment really works when he... It's like, you need the blood of a Zod and an L to open the, the vault to Doomsday. And he's like, I've already got it. And he just cuts his own hand. Like, again, it's, it's really shaky in concept. The delivery of it is really, really cool. I uh, can't help but admire it a little bit at the in the moment. Um... Let me actually use that real quick, because my I'll just say real quick, my favorite character is Brainiac, but let me just use that real quick to say, did you, um, what did you think of the idea of, like, introducing Doomsday but not using it? I think that's probably the best way to do it, because, I mean, Doomsday has always been that kind of cliffhanger, oh my god, look what's coming up next, it's Doomsday, because he's got that kind of weight around him as a character, which is really all there is to him. Um, so I feel like that's the best way you could do it because Brainiac, Zod, and Doomsday all in one thing, all trying to compete, I think was just, you obviously is too much. None of them would get the right focus. But I feel like this did a good balance while still dealing with all the regular um, Krypton stuff. But I will say the best thing about him showing up as like a tease is he looks great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's the best live action Doomsday we've gotten. I'll say that much. Um, that, that looked really good. Um, again, I, Doomsday is probably the point at which I'm like, okay, now that feels like too much fan service to me. That feels like the, the line where it just went a little too far. Um, yeah. because I, it, it seems like it's interesting bait for next season, but it definitely doesn't feel like it's necessarily enough just on its own in and of itself. Um, so I thought that part was maybe a little weaker. Um. I'm going to backtrack just a minute to ask a question that I meant to, to ask earlier, and, and you you let me forget, you bastard. Um, I was waiting until you were done with your other points to remind you about the ice. Hey, Ian, what about the ice goddess pig you wanted to talk about? Okay, okay. How the fuck did they get to cities? <laughs> like, like, seriously, like, you know, this is me going to nerd out and, and get way too scientific about the thing. I fully admit that, but, like, literally... No one can survive outside of the cities for more than a couple hours without a respirator. How the fuck did they even get to building cities? I have your answer. What's that? The sun wasn't always red, Ian. Uh, What? There you go. It's they evolved because it's an old star and that's why it turned red. Okay, yeah, that's not how that works, DC, but we'll roll with it. Uh, oh, is, that, is that seriously the explanation? Yeah, is they, is Kryptons, Kryptonians evolved under a yellow sun to absorb its radiation because their environment was so harsh, and that's why they had tougher bodies and stuff, and it was the only source they could draw from because the food and water was like not enough to survive from. It's just how their bodies evolved. And eventually, as they got more and more advanced, they built civilizations and stuff. But when the sun started to go red, they had to start adapting to that as they became weaker over time, and then eventually you get to this. And is is that just the continuity for this show, or is that general 
Krypton. That's general Kandu, Superman lore. That's ridiculously stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess I like that they're they're putting photosynthesis into just the card house of of Kryptonian biology to to justify Superman. But man, that's that's really dumb. So I mean, Krypton was pretty much fucked to begin with. If if the star went super massive red, shit. Um, yeah, it's one of those places where like sounds great on paper, the utopia of the DC universe. But there's a reason why there's not that many Green Lanterns there because they're all kind of like, eh, nah, let's that's, avoid that's that. It's got a couple years left, max, guys. Um, that's that's really funny then. Um, all right, now that's just the thing I was wondering around. Like, you need a respirator to be outside. I, you know, maybe you could do something interesting with that and say, no, the planet used to be fine, and then fucking global warming, and this is how they've adapted to that. Um, and that could be kind of cool too. I don't know, but then I don't know if the ice goddess necessarily works. It's it's up in the air. Yeah. Um, hmm. Okay. All right. That's that's the only thing I had about that. I was just curious if, if there's a clever little explanation and there's there's an attempt at one um <laughs> okay what else can we talk about with the with this uh so zod zod's probably got the the most interesting not necessarily arc but just just story in this i feel where he's he's doing a lot of time traveling around and i actually do really like the idea that he kind of wants to create a a Kryptonian army of superpowered beings. Um, like, that seems like a pretty obvious thing Zod would do with time travel, you know? Yeah, because you're like, oh shit, we have this potential. Let me go back and tell everyone else about that. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. And I like just, yeah, how much of a pragmatist he is the whole time, but like, he's really good at explaining it as pragmat pragmatism, but also. Adam Strange is right, and every course Zod wants to take probably ends up erasing Superman from existence. Um, which is kind of just an interesting, oh, is that just a happy accident for Zod, or is he intentionally trying to strategize in this way? Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. And then ultimately, just where it all ends up. Once Brainiac's defeated, Zod takes over Krypton in a month. That's ridiculously cool. Um... <laughs> Definitely, he's one of the um, he's one of the standouts in this show, and I think he's introduced at the right time. Where if he wasn't in it, it would start to feel a bit oh, okay. We know Brainiac's gonna if you know Superman law, you know C C Candle's gonna get taken no matter what. Um, it's one of those things that they're fighting against. But when Zod's introduced, and you immediately start pairing, oh, this isn't just a Zod from like when he was on with jor coming back this is a zod who's fought superman who's an established zod of like oh no adam Strange's like no this guy is like one of superman's greatest enemies he's got a backstory to him he's got that experience on an earth we haven't seen and he comes back to krypton with that and his first thought isn't oh fuck the planet's gonna explode it's no let me set up here let me build what I couldn't before in a time where jor isn't here to fuck it up and where Clark won't ever be here to fuck it up. And he just wrecks house because he's got that, he's got that warrior mentality that Krypton developed to the nth degree. He's kind of showing, okay, what happens when you make a society of building people to be specifically this one thing, eventually you can end up at the pinnacle. And in this it's Zod. And I really like that, especially when you compare that so I guess maybe we could get into how Brainiac's handled into this, is where he's very much so inquisitive, but while still at the same time being cold, I think it's really hard to balance that. And how he's handled here is both creepy and yet almost childlike when he's like with the voice of Rao and he's like thinking of different ways, like he doesn't under, like trying to understand how faith works. Mm -hmm. Like that shit's so good. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. Like, he's he's supposed to be kind of the ultimate dispassionate scientist. Like, he's, he's in this at least, he's, he's very much portrayed as, like, literally he takes cities because they're his lab rats. And so when, when people are arguing with him, when people are bargaining with him or, or begging him for mercy or whatever, he's having the reaction that, like, essentially a cold scientist has when, when a mouse is, like, squealing in pain, you know? 
It's just like, yep, I'm just doing my research here. This causes them pain. Noted. Um, like, it's just, it is so removed, but it's, it's on this very, you know, kind of, it's a very fucky level where it's just like, yes, <laughs> you're so funny. You'll say anything. You'll do anything for power. And you shall have it. Once I take Kandor, I am going to leave you. But I will leave you in charge, Darren Vex. Like, that was a really, really good scene. The only thing that kind of... I guess not undercuts it, but it, it, the only thing that could make it better is if it was proper Green Brainiac at that moment. Because, God, they do a really good job on just the look of Brainiac. Like, oh, definitely. Even, even when I had absolutely no interest in watching this show, I remember seeing the trailer and thinking, well, at least Brainiac looks legit. Like, that, they, they did a good-ass job on, on just the look of Brainiac, because... There are clearly moments where it's CG, and there are clearly moments where it's CG mixed with, um, with practical makeup, but it always looks great. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where they do it in a way where they do fake you out a little bit, where I guess may, I'd be interested to see someone who doesn't know so much about Superman lore, which I'm sure loads of people probably did watching this, um, because it was on the, the a, a actual TV channel. Um, because most people know, oh, Brainiac comes and takes Candle. That's a historical thing. But the characters in the show were like frame it at first as, oh, one of Superman's greatest enemies will come back in time and take Candle and like ruin everything and try and stop him. Uh, and when they frame that as Brainiac, you get this like interesting dichotomy of where we get to see a Brainiac who hasn't faced Superman yet where you get to see a Zod who has faced Superman yet, and they're both different worldviews of how they interact with threats, kind of leads up to which which one wins in the end, mm -hmm. is whereas Brainiac still has that idea of underestimating people because he hasn't faced this ultimate threat that can challenge him. So he gets undone in the end by kind of not putting enough value in his test subjects uh, as he kind of learns through the season when he's like exploring people's reactions, um, and I think there's that bit with like the kid mm -hmm. he's like he's um if I'm remembering correctly there's like he's this whole time he's very much a brainiac who's still learning despite how old he is he's not quite seasoned yet but with Zod he doesn't underestimate anything and he's got like backup plans or his backup plans mm -hmm. and that's why he ends up coming through in the end and I think that's a very interesting idea to pair with those two Superman foes from different points in their lives against uh oh god i feel like such a fucking fake fan for this point because i've already it's been so long i have forgotten his name but the name of the main character is superman's Seg. grandfather segal Seg segal that's i was it was like sell al for a second i knew it was something but segal his character arc next to them and like okay how does he view them as threats or allies in some cases i thought works really well and he kind of surprised me i, I um i know the actor's like a huge superman fan like he's always on twitter he's always like saying he reads all the dc books and he's like this is a guy who's a fan who became an actor and i really appreciate that mm. but i also really like him in this i think he's um it's weird to see someone from the al family like this yeah, which is, it's interesting because he starts off the series as, I guess the only comparison I have is uh, is the Chris Pine Captain Kirk, where it's like yeah. really shockingly rough and tumble, where he's like, he's getting beat up in a bar for a bet, and like, just to try to make money for his family, it was like kind of a really, you know, I, I was not expecting them to go with that kind of direction for it, and then ultimately kind of out of necessity, he has to be the most positive one in the room. Um, because everyone else is just so dour and he needs people to, like, you know, not give the fuck up. Um, like, everyone's like, oh, we could get a skimmer and go to Kryptonopolis. Um, <laughs> Imagine if everyone said that with your deflection. <laughs> It's one of those. It's one of those really silly things that, like, back in the '60s, if you'd written it in a script, an actor would have like scoffed at it and demanded they change the line. But now everyone like, 
worships the ground that the scriptwriter walks on, so no one will do that anymore, even when there's like a really silly mistake like that. Um, or a really silly misstep like that. You know, like Harrison Ford threw uh, one of the early drafts of the Star Wars script at George Lucas and told him to learn how to write dialogue. Um, <laughs> Damn. Yeah, uh, like there's just shit like that. Uh, anyway, um, and watch, someone's gonna be in the comments be like, Kryptonopolis was actually a city established in this issue of Superman. Well, it was a bad name then, too. I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, uh, like, you know, it's like, let's get a skimmer and run off to Kryptonopolis, then we'll survive. And, and even Adam Strange is kind of like that. Like, I want Brainiac to take Kandor. I just need to make, make sure Segel's out of the city at the time. Um, like, all of that stuff got really interesting, how everyone's kind of playing for the least loss, in, in a way. Like, everyone's kind of, like, looking out, not necessarily just for themselves, but, but looking to do damage control, whereas Seg is the only one actively, throughout the entire series, fighting for the best possible outcome. Um, yeah, he's the only one here who's not going out of that utilitarian mindset. Yeah, and I thought that that became really interesting. So it's like... You can see that he'd raise a very optimistic uh, person like Jor-El, and then you can see that kind of, you know, that mentality kind of coming down the family line. Uh, you know, very much father-son kind of thing, apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And I, I thought that was kind of cool, kind of an interesting idea. Um, and something I really appreciated with that specifically was we've made the owls, at least for the time being here, the working class or like the lowest class and for superman and what he stands for like as i like him as a champion of the people and the oppressed that's so good and i'm so happy we did that is where the owls aren't the privileged they're the lowest of the low they don't even they don't even have the title they don't have their crest and they have to fight for it and everything they has to fight for them to get back at it and they have to go against these people who are from the privileged and like the upper class who want to find these other ways to sacrifice the people, but Seg doesn't do that. I think that's such a clever way to bring in that socialist class roots Superman's always had in a place where that normally wouldn't be possible because it's so far removed from Earth. Yeah, yeah, I, I really do agree with that. I think that stuff does end up working out very, very effectively, even if it does feel like... Um... The, the the problem with the only problem I have with it in, in that perspective then is he's trying to get the family name back and that kind of falls into the trope of not really being downtrodden just being temporarily not rich kind of thing Right. That that does fall into that trap a little bit, but you, I, I do think they do a very good job of circumventing it because it's very clear that Seg is not fighting for a Krypton, not fighting just to get his family name back and stuff. He's fighting for a better Krypton. He wants to restructure the whole society, um, and and get rid of the idea of the rank determining that much of your life outset. You know. I think that's the thing that, that kind of helps it from falling completely into that trap. Yeah, and you can only do so much with that because, again, by necessity, you have to know jor out becomes that like, Krypton's most well-known scientist. It's just inherently with that. So you can't, you can't make it an impossibility for them to get to that rank because then you're changing too much of the law. But at the same time, I feel they do a good job by distinguishing them from the Zods particularly, which are not maybe not they are the upper class but they're also specifically always in a police kind of state which i think is interesting for that family to be in mm -hmm. yeah like especially when we get the backstory for um for zod's grandmother um ah crap now i feel like a fake fan because i can't remember her name um <laughs> would you pull up the imdb for the show please um because i can't right now and already got enough background noise. It, it, we're recording on the 4th of July, folks. Uh, happy Kill the Indian Day. Um, so, like, th that backstory we get for her character, when we get, like, the flashback to her as a little girl and her father sending her and her brother out into the wilds of Krypton, into the outside the city shield, to get 
respirators and make a miles long trek back and then there's only one respirator and the expectation is that the true zod is not the the one who um you know can go out to the wilderness and come back the true zod is the one who can go out to the wilderness and come back having defeated the other in battle I thought that, like, she comes back and she's crying. She's like, we can go. He might still be out there. He might still be alive. We can go get him. And he's, her father says, don't think of your brother. You're a Zod now or something to that effect. And it was just like, oh, man, that society is straight fucked. Like, God damn it. <laughs> um, yeah. That's some that's some uh, Spartan shit right there. Um and so, of course, Zod would, would come from that. Someone who can't see past the um, the death of Krypton, who can only see, you know, who can only dwell on the past and dwell on how to to return Krypton to its quote-unquote former glory. No, it's one of those things where stuff like that is just like trivia fan batshit nonsense I can get behind because it comes from a character place. It's not just something you'll read in like a Wikipedia article when like you're bored one day and like, oh, let me just look up the Zod family history. Like this is used to inform not only her character, but like Zod's character and like her daughter and all of that and how they interact with the owls and kind of gets into like this, like again, like Krypton as a society has always had so many different interpretations. Like sometimes it's been like a utopia and it's like a tragedy that it's gone. And then like this and Man of Steel kind of lean to the fact that no, it was fucked and it kind of had its time and now he needs Superman needs to learn from its mistakes. Mm-hmm. And I feel like both can have compelling arguments. I'm normally on the side of the planet of the super people that it's like a it's a bad thing that Krypton's gone. But I can also feel like this has inherently For this kind of show, you can't make it that because then there's no drama, there's no conflict if it's like this holy place that's lost. So I can totally understand deciding to take it to this much darker place. And how do you feel about that? See, I I always um, will side with the Krypton was kind of like, it definitely had its things that made it great, but it was was still a fundamentally flawed society. And again, that kind of plays into why I like the idea that Jarrell did choose Earth. It, it wasn't just the first planet of opportunity. Um, I like playing into that a little bit, and I think if you make Krypton kind of fucked, and Jarrell sends Cal to Earth because he sees like the potential for you know Krypton, but better in Earth. I, I think that can become kind of interesting. Um, but unfortunately, you know, it's it's a it's a messy thing to play with because I feel like it's it's very easy for it to go wrong. I think the reason I like a darker Krypton, uh, a bleaker Krypton, let me put it that way, is because I just I'm not exposed to that one as much. You know, again, this Man of Steel. I literally can't think of another Krypton that's that's portrayed this way. Everything um, else, like even in Supergirl, it's like it had its bad elements, but it's still portrayed as like a really good place. I know when, um, again, another thing, Man of Steel. I know John Byrne uh, made Krypton a very thinly veiled uh, metaphor for Soviet Russia. Okay. Um, well, that just doesn't work with Superman being a socialist at all, then. So no. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've. I guess I'm just used to Krypton being kind of, you know, all shiny and bright and perfect a la um, Don or Superman. And I feel like you do lose something a bit in that. I, I do think that the messaging works stronger if if Superman's going to be the best of both worlds. Um, I think that kind of kind of just lends itself to the, the messaging of Superman a little bit more. It's like, it's... Because, all right, all right, if you make Krypton a perfect society and Jor-El sends uh, his son to Earth and because he comes from a perfect society, he's a perfect man, I, you, you lose the importance of the Kents there. But if you, if you have Clark be from a good family in a bad place and he gets sent to a good family in a place that needs work, that's not all bad yet, but it definitely needs work, 
then I think you get a stronger messaging. Then it's less about Superman being an angel and more about Superman being a hero, you know? Right, yeah. My argument have always been, though, because I feel like, again, I feel like both takes can work. Um, it just depends on how you do it. Because I like the Krypton is not necessarily utopia because there's obviously just inherently that the Phantom Zone is fucked up. <laughs> the yeah. fact that Jor-El made that and like it's still being used just horrible. You're literally sending prisoners to hell for eternity with no trial. Like what I mean, the it's, fuck? it's it's space Australia. Come the fuck on. <laughs> so like that's always something you have to deal with, and I feel that's important because it, it it makes it from being like you say the the perfect thing. But I also feel like it's important to have a, something the home planet lost is there has to be a loss there. There has to be something of the fact that Superman is an adventure character can go anywhere except for the place where he would have been truly in it with people that could actually understand him fully. Um, I feel like that adds to the isolationist aspect. It helps from keeping him so... Because the part of where some Superman adaptions fall apart with like the immigrant metaphor and loses its power is so many fall to the place where Krypton was wrong, America is right, now he can have America culture. Like, Man of Steel does that a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think that really hurts the interest of he's lost his place but he's bringing his culture with him to a new land and that new land can help him develop that and there's a much more cohesive melding there when you make sure krypton isn't a total hellscape and see i think i think you can have it both ways i honestly do think you can have your cake and eat it too because just because krypton is fucked when he gets sent away which, I mean, come on, they let their planet die because no one wanted to listen to jor right? Yeah. Like, there, there has to be some level of fuckery going on. But just because Krypton's fucked when Superman gets sent away doesn't mean that it always had to have been. So, like, I kind of like the idea that, like... All right, this is... This risks sounding a bit ignorant, but just stick with me here. So let us imagine a child from... F well, let's, let's, let's pick Saudi Arabia. Let us imagine a child from Saudi Arabia, because the, the thing you got to remember with, with Krypton that, that changes it just a little bit because it's all sci-fi is uh, Superman ship seems to have faster than light travel, but not, not um, oh, what's the word I want here? Not uh, current time faster than light travel. Like, it, it seems like... Yes, the ship can get across light years faster than than just traveling at the speed of light, but that doesn't circumvent relativity like a lot of faster than light travel does for shows, like Star Trek does, where yeah, you're traveling faster on than light. The, like yeah. Krypton will be like a thousand years ago it blew up. Yeah, exactly. So, like that that creates an, an interesting dynamic. But so what I like to imagine here is that. Superman is like a child from Saudi Arabia who who is left at when the society is at its worst, when it's like on the brink of collapse kind of thing. If you imagine a Saudi's uh, Syria, there we go. That's that's a better example, Ian. Um, so like I like to imagine that that um, Kal El is a child sent out of Syria as it is now, where the entire society is kind of collapsed and it's it's just not a very good place to be. Um, and then, you know, it's taken him years and years to get to where he's going and land. And then he's only able, as a man, to recover bits and pieces about his, his culture's history. And so, if you look at Syria, like, in its, its far past, in, like, the golden age of the Islamic empires... It's like a beautiful place. There's like all kinds of rich culture. And so I like to imagine Superman, like when he's, you know, that scene in All-Star Superman where he's like wearing formal Kryptonian dinnerware. It's like he's wearing something from Krypton's Middle Ages. And he just doesn't quite realize it because he doesn't know exactly the time frame that this was Kryptonian formal wear. Like, I like the idea that, that he's he's only able to become aware of certain parts of his culture because those were the best parts of his culture, you know? Yeah, so I, th I think you can have your cake and eat it too there, that, that you can have Krypton by the time Kal-El leaves be just an absolute shit show, but that doesn't mean that it was always that way. 
No, that's a good idea. I have never really thought of really t- factoring the the time aspect into what he gets. But no, that totally works. It's a good way to it's a good way to console both. I I appreciate that actually. That's given me some new perspective on things. Oh, cool! Yay! See, you're not even a real Superman fan. Um, <laughs> you're a fucking fake fanboy. You just dress up in Superman gear to try to distract people. And get now attention. I'm doing drastic off his Batman gear to strap people. Uh, oh, by the way, her name is Jane Azad. I got the IMDb Jaina. up here. Okay. Yeah, Jaina and then uh, Lyra, right? Or no. Laura? Lyta. 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 Yeah, Lyta. So, oh my god, I imagine if her name was Car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Jaina, Jaina was an interesting character. I, I liked some of the OC characters here quite a bit. Like, as much as I like Zod and I love Brainiac in this, I want to talk maybe a little bit more about Brainiac before we wrapped up. I did like some of the the OCs, like the Darren Vex and, um, oh, what's her, what is the daughter's Nissa name? Vax is Nissa quite Vax. Yeah. yeah, I, I like the, thought the thought two so. of them quite a bit. Um, and I, I also did like Jaina and Lyta Zod. I thought those were, were pretty good characters, too. Yeah, um, especially just because, like... One of the advantages of setting this so far back is you can get away with stuff like that more. It's like, yeah, okay, Superman's great grandmother and like grandmother haven't really been brought up that much. You can kind of make get away with who will they get with kind of thing. And then we eventually get to the fact that it's both, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I'm just like, all right. Uh, Segal has got two sets of children coming from his loins, which is interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work out, particularly with... Um, with... Because we've got a corrupted timeline here, right? Yeah, this isn't... Zod has changed things even if we get things back on track. Yeah, like especially with that, that really great shot of the cape... The, the shield on the cape changing to the House of Zod logo. I thought that was really, really cool. Um, like, so Zod's... We've got a corrupted timeline where Zod's clearly just in a parallel timeline now. He's not... He is the Zod from the Krypton that blew up, and he went and fought Superman. Then he went back in time, and he's changed history now so that, you know, obviously it's it's not the same set of circumstances anymore. And that's just, in and of itself, kind of interesting um, because I, I'm just not sure when Zod was going to come into the picture because Light of X, or, damn it, what is it again? No, Lytazod. Lytazod, and what was the Vex woman? Nissa Vex. Nissa Vex. Because Nissa Vex and, and Segel were going to have a kid, and that's probably supposed or going to end up being Jor-El. Um, and then Lyta and uh, Seg were going to have a kid, and that was going to be Zod. And is his name just Zod Zod? Does he get a first name? Yeah, he is. <laughs> it's... um. I think it's Drelzod or something. Drelzod? But he just, but he's only referred to as Zod because obviously his title is General. Mm-hmm. That's that's funny. Um, and Drell kind of almost sounds like General a little bit. That's funny. Um, yeah, it's just I don't know. It's it's weird how that kind of works out. Where it's like it's so, Seg and Lyta were gonna have a kid, and then Seg and and um, every time I fucking forget it, so I'm not gonna ask again. The Vex woman, we're gonna have a kid. I can remember her dad's name, but not her name, and it's pissing me off. It's <laughs> Nissa. Nissa. Nissa Vex. Nissa Vex. Nissa Vex. Nissa Vex. Nissa Vex. Nissa Vex. Sounds like a Nissa Vex. We have a Nissa Vex. Um, Nissa Vex. 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 Nissa Vex. Uh, that's that's my best Ben Stein you're gonna get. Um. Anyway, yeah, like so. Th- that was going to be kind of interesting to, to see how it could develop, but now it it can't really. Like, if Seg ends up having a baby with Lyta at this point, he's kind of just an irresponsible person, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> unless, I mean, I guess Lyta could just be an irresponsible person because she's kind of proven herself at that already, where she, like, maybe she has some of Seg's blood and she just decides... Even if he's gonna become this, I I still need part of Seg in my life or something. Yeah, I mean the way Krypton has set up its society, it's a very efficient way of doing shit like that. It's just like, oh well, we don't actually need them to fuck. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um 
So yeah, I don't know. That that stuff was pretty cool. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit more about Brainiac because we've we've yet to touch on one thing that I think is a a wholly unique addition that this makes to Brainiac, and it's one of those things where if the comics run with it, I will be so happy. And that's that when Brainiac takes a city, it doesn't just continue to exist as a city on its own. It freezes everyone in place, but they're all perfectly aware of every passing moment. That is some of the most fucked up shit I think you could have done to make Brainiac taking cities more terrifying than it already was. Yeah. Um, I quite... It's one of those things where I can totally understand the idea behind it. Because it is such... Well, he doesn't... He wants to have all knowledge in the universe. And as long as as there's life, there's going to be new things happening. There's going to be new things to learn. And he can't keep up with that. So he has to systematically either destroy things and then freeze things until he is the only still moving thing in the universe because everything else is either destroyed or frozen in his collection. Like that makes a logical endpoint for how Brainiac is going to continue his goal. So that makes sense to me rather than him like micromanaging every single and like keeping tabs on every single city he's ever bottled. Mm-hmm. But like you say, it's also like Jesus Christ, the existential terror of that is unimaginable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I thought I thought that was such a cool and unique idea to add to to Brainiac's arsenal, and and it, it especially makes like his promises to Darren Vex extra sadistic, you know. Like, it, it, what's really interesting is they give teases about it earlier on in the season, but once you finally get like the full out, this is what he does. It's even more terrifying than you could imagine, because like. You know, we both read action comics by Morrison, and, and you know, uh, Luther's playing a very Darren Vex role in that, where it's like, okay, he's bargained with Brainiac to just take Metropolis, so he's he knows the whole, the whole planet's fucked, but if he can save just Metropolis, then at least that's something. And so this almost makes that gamble null and void, right? The yeah. idea that, like, oh, no, you can save your city, and, and I'll even let you rule over your city. But you're never going to move from that spot for the rest of, of, for the rest of eternity. You are never going to move another muscle. That's really fucked up. Um, and, it, it, and the way he, like, plays with people, and he, he finds them just, just so amusing... Um, because of all that, gets really, really interesting. Because, like, he sees them bargaining and working, trying to get power and all this stuff, and he's like, oh, you don't even understand what I'm going to do to you. You're just going to be my little figure on a shelf. And that's, you know, it's one of those things where, like, it's such a silly Silver Age concept of this alien that goes planet to planet and just steals cities and puts them in little, little glass bottles... And it just takes that really kind of goofy thing and makes it as, as terrifying as it could possibly be. Yeah, and something I'd maybe like to see as well is this version of Brainiac, if we get to, like, if just hypothetically imagine this battle with Superman, he ends up, Superman takes back the bottle city of Kandor. How much more tragic is that is that Superman now is not only forced with the normal dilemma he has is, oh, I have to free them up and I have to bring them back to size. He's like, no, I have my people here. They're here. I can see them, but they're frozen in eternity and I can't figure out how to freeze them. Like, that makes that so much more powerful. And see, I, I don't know. I think I think that might be almost a little too dark to, to Superman. I think the fact that he can <laughs> never grow them back up is already is already motivation enough. I like the idea that maybe he gets the bottle city back and the best he can do is just restore movement and Yeah, that, and that would be a, that would be like and after a year's worth of Superman stories, that's how you end it with like that one victory. Yeah, yeah, that could be a really cool idea. Um so you mentioned that and that does make me think of this and and I do want to ask it. So it seems that so the tradition with Superman shows is Superman can't show up in them, at least not at first. Because he's not in Supergirl till season two, right? And he's not in Smallville till season ten. <laughs> um, so, do you want Superman to show up in this show? Oh, I want Superman to show up in everything. I would... I, I, I'm, just, I'm just really curious 
you've already crossed the threshold. Like at this point, we've already had Zod from that timeline. We've already got Doomsday on the wings. They've already got Lobo in season two. And I think they've already said they want to do Hawkman, Fanagar. They want to get the Green Lanterns in. Like they're really not tipping their toes in what they're allowed to do. I say, why the fuck not? Like have him in for a season and see what's, but like he's not allowed. Cause that would be such an interesting perspective to have maybe do this idea you had where he's just like, okay, he's a Superman who has got stuff from ancient Krypton. He's got this much more idealized picture of it in his head than it actually is. So when he gets here, he's kind of like a hold. Yeah. Or like disheartened about what he's found. And he's like, shit. But then through SAG, he learns to see the good parts. And eventually he comes back away. Like his arc in that would be like coming away with a new perspective on, okay, earth seems bad but it isn't as bad as this yet. I've got a goal. I know I can make things better. Like, that would be a good arc. I think that could be good for, like, a season, like, in season three or four or something. Yeah, I could see that. Um, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see how long they're going to keep Brainiac as kind of the mainstay villain. I haven't seen anything of season two yet, but I know, like, a lot of it's reflecting, or going to revolve, or at least the f- beginning of it is going to revolve around Seg and Brainiac being trapped in the Phantom Zone. Um, so I don't know, like, how much longer Brainiac's gonna kick around as the main thread, if, if, like, Sega's gonna get out of the Phantom Zone, but Brainiac's not, or what's gonna come on with that. But, I mean, they've, they've pretty much established Kandor getting taken is inevitable. And, and so, even if they've stopped Brainiac for now, he's, get, his ass is getting out. That's, that's the, probably the last season or something, right? Yeah. Um, you know that's that's gotta happen it's it's inevitable to happen um but where we go in the meantime you know we've already established that adam strange can bring people back or, or can at least send people that are not himself back um because that was kind of his plan for a while was to send like green lantern or somebody um so the the possibility for Superman to show up does exist. I don't know if it's going to happen sooner or later or not at all, but I would like to see it too. I think that it, it could be a cool thing. Um, I doubt they'd do it, but what if they got to, what's his name, Tyler Holchin? Uh, to, yeah, Tyler Hecklin. That would be so good. That would um, be so cool. But even that, because like, then you could you could tie it in because this is – so far, it's not. It, it's been so loose that you could kind of fit into Supergirl or Man of Steel like continuity. If you have, it, it's its own thing. But like, if you wanted to be like a fanboy and just be like, yeah, maybe Wink and a Nudge could fit in. But like, I feel like he's already like got good material to work with. I think maybe the bigger pull, which obviously won't happen, but I'd be so happy for him if it did. If Henry Cavill came in on this and actually got to be in a good Superman like thing, <laughs> I'd be so. That'd be such a good like send off for his career if like this was one of the last things he did he got to see a krypton inspired by his own movie series but like handled much better than that and maybe got some good writing stuff who seems to understand superman a bit more i think that'd be really nice to see i think you could play it off um I, I know I saw a clip from season two. It's quite funny. Is you know like arm reload he does in Mission Impossible. Where, like, yeah, like, yeah. Cameron Cuff does that as Segal in one of the episodes of season two. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. And he like he tweeted it. And he was like, "Where do you think he got it from?" <laughs> Oh, that's too funny. I hope they end up in, like, a movie together so that they can, like, take take set photos and be like, just hanging out with my grandson. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so cool. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, that, that stuff's, um... There, there is possibility. It would be really exciting to, to see that happen in, uh, in future seasons. Um, again, this, this series was... A pleasant surprise is what I, I think I'd end up calling it. Um, I do have one thing I want to ask you, though, before we like fully wrap up, just because of how big you are. Are there any Green Lantern characters you would like to show up on this? Um, if I'm remembering correctly, Krypton is in Sector 2813 and Earth is in Sector 2814. And so Tomar Ray would be the Green Lantern of Krypton. Yes, if, he is. If I'm, yeah, okay. So, if he shows up, like, what, what's really interesting, particularly in the, the context of Krypton, 
is they have yet to make interstellar contact until Brainiac. And so if a Green Lantern shows up, that's kind of a game changer for them. And they, you know, their, their first interstellar contact is hostile. Zod is currently in control of their government, as far as I'm aware, because I haven't watched season two. Um, that could be kind of an interesting game changer. Like, Zod would probably know what Green Lanterns are at this point, but would he attack them or not is, is kind of an interesting question. So that could maybe be a, a fun a fun premise for an episode or something, if nothing else. Um, and if it, if it was going to be Green Lantern, I hope it'd be Tomar Ray. Um, otherwise, maybe, I don't know, it might be fun to throw one of the really wacky Green Lanterns in there. Like, like what if it's like Tomar Ray trained in Chip? That'd be fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, it's Chip's rookie mission. He hasn't earned his badge yet. That could be a, that could be a cool idea. Yeah, stuff like that would be really interesting because, again, we're getting Lobo and, like, he looks straight off the page. Rainax straight off the page. Doomsday straight off the page. Just for surprisingly, as, like, non-Superman elements are in, like, the regular Krypton designs, like, we're not getting people in, like, the skin-tight suits as much or the capes as often as they probably should be. But, like, the villain designs are, like, spot-on comic polls. I would be very interested to see what they would do. Like, even the Superman cape is just... It's got the yellow S on the back and everything. It's from the comics, 100%. Mm-hmm. I'd be very interested to see what a Green Atom would even look like in this. Yeah, I mean, that'd be cool as shit. Um, and again, their CG has been pretty damn good, especially with Brainiac. I mean, sci-fi channels come a long way since the early 2000s. Um, so it, it would be kind of neat to see see them pull off like a fully alien Green Lantern like Tomar Ray. Or hell, maybe just borrow the 3D model from the, the movie. Just do it. Just, just fucking do it. Um, the resource exists. Use it. Um, <laughs> Let me just say this. I'll just say my piece real quick before I move on from Tomar Ray. Um, my dream casting for Tomar Ray is David Hyde Pierce to do the voice. I, he doesn't have to do the motion capture, but I want David Hyde Pierce to do the voice for Tomar Ray because Tomar Ray is so prim and proper. It's it, either David Hyde Pierce for, for Tomar Ray or for Salak, depending. Uh, I, I could go either way, but they're both very kind of uptight, prim and proper, so it could be fun. I could see that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alrighty. The only other thing I had that I wanted to make sure we at least opened the door to cover before we went on to um, to ratings, since we've been, you know, pretty overwhelmingly positive on this. Um, do you have anything that you think just stands out as like, yeah, even they, they tried their best, but this just doesn't work, or this is just kind of objectively a negative for the sh- series? I do feel like it didn't need to be as long. Mm. I feel that's its biggest detriment. I think it could have been. I think you could have tightened this up an episode or two and cut them off, and it would have been stronger result. Okay. All right. Uh, for me, I think some of the stuff was maybe just a little, little bit of a bridge too far uh, here and there with some of the more fan servicey elements. Um, like again, the Val L is the one that creates the Phantom Zone, and and. Uh, doomsdays, you know, just sitting on Krypton and stuff. At a certain point, when you make every Superman villain from Krypton, Superman just becomes the problem and Lex Luthor's right. Uh, so I think, <laughs> I think that's one of those things where they, they kind of need to back off of that one maybe a little bit. Um, otherwise, I think a lot of other stuff about this works. So those, those things I think are problems, but not really significant. I'll probably only be taking off like half a point for those kind of like here and there little issues um all righty well you want to go ahead and go on to ratings yeah sure thing um this was a series that definitely from premise alone was like ugh, please just make a goddamn superman show <laughs> but once we got into it i do feel like this is this is definitely the best of those that have been executed this is something that i feel like is a premise which justifies doing this story it understands the limits of said story and finds creative ways to work around them gets pulls in old dc universe stuff isn't shy away from something but also at the heart of it has some good character acting um and like the set design everything getting to live on krypton feels like something that i could definitely see going on for years to come i definitely would feel like if they maybe played a bit fast and loose with the time bit maybe we get like a jor-el for three seasons later on 
this could be something that lasts uh, for ages and I'd be with it all the way as long as the quality stays the same. So I'm going to give it um, four doomsdays in a vault playing checkers because when are we going to be relevant? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give this uh, 4.5 out of 5 uh, waiting till the last possible moment to say Neil before Zod. <laughs> um, so yeah that's that's gonna be it for me all right alfie fun as always sir definitely thanks for bringing me on for this yeah no problem all right everyone thanks very much for watching until next time i'm the philosopher i'm a geek for fun and we are your geeky gentlemen and we will be discussing things